Right, okay, I think we're going to get underway. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second panel, who'll be looking at uh, collaboration and participatory practices. Um, joining us are artist Alison Craighead, who works with John Thompson. Um, as I mentioned, Alison is a reader in contemporary art at the University of Westminster and also teaches at Goldsmiths. And John is professor of fine art at the Slade. Um, we're also joined by artist, uh, well, we'll do it in order, not in the way I written it, wrote it down on my piece of paper, by artist Alan Kane whose work asks some cheeky questions, I would say, about how the art world defines high and low art and how it values individual creativity. Um, most of Alan's projects involve some form of collaboration or participation. Um, and Alan was a selector for New Contemporaries in 2016. Um, and last but not least, we're joined by artist duo Coolinan and Richards, um, Charlotte Coolinan and Janine Richards, um, who work with an expanded practice based around painting and beyond. Um, Charlotte is a professor at Kingston University where she teaches fine art, and Janine is also at Kingston University as school director of research and enterprise, and Coolinan and Richards were selectors for New Contemporaries in 2012. So we're going to start with Charlotte and Janine's presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, uh, and thank you very much for Kirsty for inviting us to be here. Um, I'm just going to um, read out some notes that, that we've made together. Um, and Charlotte's going to um, interject when uh, I go wrong. Um, uh, we're, very, we're really delighted to be invited to participate in this celebration, 70 years of new contemporaries. And um, we can vaguely remember being chosen to exhibit in a new contemporaries edition ourselves in the Sainsbury Centre Norwich after graduating from art school. But that's a very, very long time ago now. Um, We've decided to show um, some slides of our work whilst we talk for around 10 minutes about our practice and the opportunities that collaboration and participation offer and some of the pitfalls too. Um, so we started working together as Art Lab in 1997 and we were artists in residence at the science-based Imperial College London. Um, so we were putting on a programme of, of exhibitions um, as artists. At that point we wanted to make work that somehow got in between the institution and the exhibition as some form of collaboration um, to support artists that could be best described as support structures, either physical or conceptual. I'll just make the point that actually the slides don't relate to what I'm talking about, they're just of our work, so sorry, sorry about that, it's a bit confusing. Um, so a sort of linking in between thing was important to us and um, it led to a, a way of um, approaching and making individual artworks. Um, and we continue to be fascinated by the idea of um, the unfixed, of something intuitive, of something perhaps a bit theatrical and a sort of, um, you know, something that can be several things at once and in, invites a kind of risk, both, you know, that it, it, it might fall down, it might be one thing and another thing at the same time. Um, and exploring the relationship between object and exhibition. Um, at the early stage of our working as an artist duo, we began to think of exhibition as a medium. So the walls, the ceiling, the floor, the lighting, invitation cards, food, drinks, openings took up our equal attention in the destabilization of conventional hierarchies of display. So for us, exhibition became material. And I think that what we were thinking when we talked about this idea of collaboration, that it wasn't so much that it happens all the time and that for us, even though we work together, that for us isn't really what we would think of as the collaboration, it's that how we want the work to operate and how we want the work to collaborate 
with other works or with its situation or to create a situation that can operate in a certain way is what we think of as an exploration of collaboration. Um, so we saw this um, kind of support mechanism as a form of collaboration that related to earlier groups like the 1967 Arts Lab um, of Drury Lane Gallery Space and the warehouse in NW1 that presented J.G. Ballard's Crash Cars exhibition as a multidisciplinary, non-hierarchical exhibition space. Um, several artists were interested in collaborating with us in the Art Lab series at Imperial College in the early 2000s because of the contextual history of artists um, who worked with institutions from, that, from the 1960s. And for us, that was very exciting, which it's added a social and political dimension to float older generation artists, John Latham and Barbara Stevaney from ABG, um, Stephen Willits, Gustav Mesker, Ray Brown from UCLA, alongside um, our peers, people who, friends and associates and um, artists who were working at the time, Jemima Stelly, Jeanette Paris, Margarita Glutzberg, Milenis Dragashevich, Sarah Staten, Joan Key. Um, at one point, we invited the entire staff in the Department of Fine Art at the Slade to make a show, and, um, and we also worked with Dustin Arison. These, this is just an example of some of the people that we work with. Um, one of the pitfalls in the way we make work is that it is hard to actually talk about because it is um, ultimately a, f a complex, fluid, multi-layered endeavor. Um, one of the ways that is helpful is to trace a lineage to this original Arts Lab movement from the 60s, for example, and to loosely relate Art Lab to a sort of movement. Ultimately, too, it is a conscious decision to surround a fairly straightforward practice, that uh, the kind of work that we produce with a complex narrative of networks, collaborations, and exchanges. Um, and it's very hard to put a value on the way people operate together, the way artists work, making that more explicit. Um, we stopped calling ourselves Art Lab, um, and as we wanted to express that we were making work more specifically and aesthetically controlling what we do and our production. So our production has always centered on the studio, and we want to explore using that space um, in a different ways through um, the shop we created at the front of the studio. Um, and that is called For Cosa. And it is built as an artwork, as it started as a central sculptural set of shelves and it expanded into a walls and um, uh, we put a special door in the front of the studio so you could get into that space directly from the street. Um, so for us it's an artwork that works as an expanded form of exchange and so what happens in there for us is another form of collaboration. Um, so the point of our practice is to ask questions about existing display systems and the use of art objects and art production. Um, one of the problems that this is that the exchange, problems for us, is that the exchange sometimes makes, can make the product invisible. We are overtly discussing the complexities around production and relationships as part of the product. That's why it gets difficult as we open up discussion that's more complex than an individual artwork might require. So it's sort of adding something that it, it's not really needed or particularly helpful, one might say, in some aspects. Maybe because of this erosion of the importance of one author and the refusal to promote a singular object, we start to allow a group of artworks, for example, to collaborate with each other. That's what I was saying at the beginning about activating something with the artworks. Um, so to create a kind of mise-en-scene with the artworks and open up alternative uses and wider discussions. Did you want to say something? Sorry, I went very fast. I mean, we, we wanted to just have the slides running kind of behind um, uh, the 10-minute um, 
presentation, not, not, not because we're um, illustrating each one, but it's just to give you a sort of flavour. Um, and we, we don't generally like to show photographs with people in them, but you can imagine a lot of these um, exhibition spaces are uh, rather fu much fuller with, with, with the participants, as it were. And I think we're quite, I think we're under 10 minutes, but I think we can finish there. Thanks. Um, I'm not going to add to the thank yous for coming. You've had enough of those. Um, this section of the talk I'm calling Pablo Picasso and my role in his success. Um, I came across this brilliant work of art when I was quite young, and I don't even know if I was going to be an artist at this stage. Maybe this started it off, but um, I was standing enjoying this work, the audacity, the playfulness of it, um, and it slowly sort of dawned on me that um, there were kind of gaps in the work that I was doing quite a lot to fill. For instance, we're assuming that this semicircle is a table, even though there's no legs. We're assuming these rather lumpen bits of wood are food, a knife, and so forth. So it started to dawn on me that I was participating in some way in the work. And that realization led to the idea, the radical idea, that if I'm participating in the work, then Pablo Picasso is also notionally a participant in the work. Um, and that, in a way, has kind of informed everything I've done since. This idea that you've got a participant at either end of the work also throws up a couple of other questions or interesting points, I think. That if you've got this relationship between who's notionally the producer and notionally the, uh, the consumer, um, two things happen. One, it allows the, the potentially allows the idea for more than two participants. You could have up to God forbid, six or seven or maybe a million participants. And two, that if you've got all these different participants around emotional artwork, or probably more accurately, an art experience, then your role as an artist, or my role as an artist, might be able to be a lot more flexible. So I could take or assume any position around the artwork, uh, leading all the way around from being a painter that makes daubs in the studio to being someone that does almost nothing and enjoys the um, enjoys what comes from almost nothing being done. <laughs> um, I made in 2009 a work for television with Art Angel and Channel 4 Television. Um, I should run the, the. There was a. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is the title titles sequence, um, and we'll run it for as long as it. it I can talk about it. of the artist's relationship to the model. When you're drawing a, a people, whether it's a portrait or a drawing of their whole body, I think the contribution of the so-called model, the so-called sitter, but in actual fact, n neither of those words are very adequate because it's much more active than that. I mean, when something really works, it's an active collaboration. Um, I mean, it's not a question of keeping still or, or, or taking the right pose. I mean, it's not that. It's a kind of uh, radiation. Because really, drawing is a question of, of being open, of receiving. 
It's, it's absolute balls to talk about drawing as creative. It's, it's a question of being receptive. Uh, and what the, what the model can do is to send you a message to encourage that receptivity. That gives you a sense of what we were broadcasting. Uh, very much. Very keen to get this in before the death of... I mean, not many years afterwards, where broadcast television basically stopped existing as a, as a unique entity. So this was at the end of broadcast television, really. And I was very keen that it be broadcast on old-fashioned terrestrial television and not be part of the kind of, you know, uh, downloadable watch-at-any-time thing. Um, but we broadcast this in the daytime, so every, every lunch hour over, it was half an hour episode each, and every lunch hour over, five days, uh, one episode was broadcast. We had Maggie Hamblin with her model, Matthew. And then the drawings, I kind of wasn't that interested in, in collecting them or anything, but they kind of accumulate themselves in, a, in an online, in, on Flickr, in fact, as, um, as was talked about earlier. You can't talk about collaboration, collaborative artists, without discussing Gilbert and George. Now, obviously, this isn't Gilbert and George, but we were trying to be Gilbert and George for this picture. This is my friend Simon and I a very long time ago. I had a lot more hair. Um, and we made, you know, we were old friends, and we made some very quick artworks, photographed ourselves in black and white film, three rolls of black and white film, made cheap posters, and sold them uh, in a, an old synagogue on Brick Lane for £10 each, and it was the most successful uh, artwork I had made today. I, s I made enough money to cover our costs, have a curry for a few friends in a local restaurant, and get a taxi home. So that was a great <laughs> success. Um, and haven't had as much success since, I think. Um, we promised ourselves, because we had such a good time, that we would make another show together. Um, and it took us 18 years to make this show um, called as The Asbury Mystery Play and other, other public works. And by this stage, Simon was working with a very good West End gallery, and, sh and the gallerist there was very kindly invited us to make the show in her space. So we made a slightly grander show than we made the first time, spent a bit more money, but again, we had a good laugh. Again, we got away without it costing us too much, so that was great fun. And the premise for this show was to make works which didn't really exist, actually. They were proposals for potential public artworks. And because we work in the commercial gallery, we felt we had no responsibility to make these viable, so it didn't matter that they couldn't be realized. Um, but at the same time, you know, we were undermining the notion of buying artworks in our heads because they were just uh, proposals for something else, really. The big lighter um, is, a, is a proposal for a public, public lighting in a public square. Um, a, a proposal for a roundabout sculpture, which um, was realised through a set of five postcards, as if the thing already existed. Um, a public sculpture for prison exercise yard. This is a prison exercise yard piñata. We put um, this concrete block actually contains a little bit of doobie and a few pills and some cigarettes. So if you actually got got it open, you'd um, you'd have a treat. Another artist I work with, this is a very old photograph of him. You might have come across Jeremy Deller in his bloody rampaging success. Um, this is one of my favourite works of his. His where he, he basically, when his parents went on holiday, he turned his he turned their house into a public into a, into an exhibition space. <laughs> Instead of having a party, he had an exhibition. And a great work. You treat this place like a hotel. But yeah, again, Jeremy was a friend, and just through conversations, we ended up making, you know, coming up with ideas and making works together. This was perhaps the biggest thing we made. A series of exhibitions uh, was a touring exhibition around the theme of, of updating the idea of folk art. So stuff people were making on the streets. Essentially, it's working class art, art in my view. I mean, Jeremy would argue against that, but. Um, works that people make for their own amusement and, and public consumption. Um, another work I made with Jeremy was uh, a pair of um, 
souped up tea urns and teapots. And this work was supposed to be a binary work. So there were two of the same things made at the same time. One was supposed to go into the community. This, is, this one was given to a, a village hall in, in the northwest of England. And one was supposed to go into the rarefied atmosphere of the art world. And in fact, it couldn't have worked out any better at all because the Tate acquired this. So uh, one object is an artwork in the Tate collection, and the other one works in a village hall serving tea. Um, I also, because of this idea that I didn't have to make the work myself being quite easy to me, I made a series of exhibitions using um, people who weren't artists. Um, for, for Art on the Underground, 2009 roughly again, when they were digging up the whole of Stratford, um, they asked artists to make in installations or artworks in the station, the tube station. And my idea with this was that if you were, you know, in, in the upheaval coming from development, usually stuff's found, treasure's found. And we were looking at the treasure that people might have under their bed. So local collectors were invited to exhibit their collections. Um, Casey Young had a collection of teaspoons from when the age of about eight. He'd been collecting teaspoons from everywhere he went, souvenir spoons. Um, a football trainer called Jack Harrison had a collection of Michael Jackson bad albums. Michael Jackson wasn't in great favour in this point in history, so uh, he was able to come across quite a lot of bad albums in, in every charity shop near his house. Um, so I've been making things with lots of people in that weren't necessarily artists, I've been making things with artists, and I had a kind of fluid idea, a more promiscuous idea of what collaborating was than, than perhaps Gilbert and George um, espouse. Um, uh, but even so, even with the idea in my head that lots of people, everyone potentially was an artist, I had a group of society, I mean, some section of society that I had completely and willfully disregarded as having a creative voice, having a creative value. Um, and then on a visit back to my parents' house one weekend, I realised out of the corner of my eye that my parents had a visual sensibility of their own. I had absolutely ignored and almost um, you know, like I say, willfully disregarded the fact that my parents were visual people. So for Freeze 2009, my gallerist asked me if I would do a solid presentation. I suggested to him, to his credit, he said yes to it, that we present um, the things that my mum and dad decorate their house with. Um, and it was commercial suicide for him, but I was very pleased with the work. <laughs> <laughs> made me very happy. Obviously, you know, people come and say, is this all for sale? I said, no, I've got to send it back to my mum's next week, so <laughs> don't break anything. Um, we had a series of postcards which we were giving away, so again, another suicidal um, strategy, commercially speaking. Um, but, you know, the kind of things that most people would not, would have around. Um, and then, kind of, Extending that slightly, while sort of removing even more control from what was going on than using other people's things, um, a gallery in Germany invited me to make an exhibition, and I, again they very bravely said yes to making 27 plinths, filling the gallery with empty plinths, and making an invitation on the invite card for people to bring things they don't want. So this exhibition was called The Unwanted, and it was an art exhibition made up of things that people brought in that they didn't want. Um, and the things that they brought in varied. We had a prize for the most abject object, actually. And I gave the prize to this, uh, this contributor, because this just seemed like the saddest, most pathetic uh, thing that came in. And, um, and the prize was, miraculously, a signed photograph of their object returned to them. <laughs> but this is the exhibition, and I think, you know, it's a it's a good-looking contemporary art exhibition. Right? <laughs> um, and then the final piece I want to talk about. So I, I met a group of young people in, in Coventry um, last year, the year before last. And I, I proposed to them that, that while they're all going to die, and this is a, a potentially a, a sad thought, that they could take slightly more charge of their, uh, of their epitaphs. So um, I was thinking the idea that, the, that your gravestone is some kind of public sculpture and that you could take some control over making that public sculpture. So we had a, a you know, brainstorming session. They all wrote down their ideas for their own graves. And then we produced those graves for the gallery nearby uh, Royal Shakespeare Company uh, in Stratford. 
So uh, the work was, or well, the show was called Early Graves, and each grave represents one of those nice young people that's hopefully still alive as we speak. Um, but um, I don't know, sort of thinking about making it a playful notion that you might muck about with your gravestone. So I think that's my 10 minutes. In fact, we're already 30 minutes in, and we should. Um, Okay, so, um, yeah, so we're, we're going to talk about two works, and we're going to, you know, obviously we are a collaboration, and I think we've been working together since 1994, so, yes, so we, yeah, in a similar thing that I think uh, you guys said, I actually, yeah, I just take it for granted that everybody collaborates. <laughs> but we thought that um, it would be really interesting to talk about projects where we've collaborated with other people or uh, and what that's brought to our practice. Um, the first piece uh, is called Stutterer, and it's a collaboration in the sense that we were asked by the welcome uh, to uh, talk to some computational biologists and then through a research, a collaborative research process, develop a work, although we ended up developing a work discreetly out of that. The second thing we're going to talk about is an absolute collaboration with another person. Um, this work is called Stutterer. Uh, and um, when we were talking to the computational biologists, they were telling us a bit about epigenetics and genetics, and we were obviously interested in genomes, and um, uh, the human genome in particular. And then we ended up talking quite a lot about uh, the human reference genome, which is what is referred to now as the first ever genome that was sequenced, the, um, the genome project that ran from 1990 to 2003. And I guess, uh, in many ways, we can see this project as a kind of monument to the, this collaborative project of scientists from all over the world working together towards sequencing the first human genome. It took over 13 years, and uh, those years were like 1990 to 2003. And for us, it kind of, it brought out what we, well, what I thought to be the best like approach of working together collectively to you know to try and understand um, or sequence the first human genome um, the, the the genome is a text file basically that um, and it it's 1.3 billion characters long I might be wrong there sorry uh, but it's very long uh, and it's just made up of T's A's G's and C's which represent the four base pair nucleotides that comprise uh, DNA um, so we decided to use it like a musical score and to just play it from beginning to end letter by letter which is what you can see here with the two screens uh, and as it plays um, it triggers uh, from a database of clips of broadcast television um, words that begin with the letter T A G C. So I don't know terrorism, um, apples, uh, God, uh, lots of words like that. And uh, and they're, they're chosen at random um, uh, out of sort of four different places. Uh, and that the um, the the the, um, the only rule, if you like, apart from choosing a clip at random as a letter comes up, is that if the letter repeats, the clip repeats, and it creates this sort of stuttering effect illustrated in, in, in our genetic code. And the other rule that we were forgetting there was that all the footage we were looking at had to be found or broadcast during the 13 years it took to make the genome. So it's a bit complicated to describe it, but actually it's easier to understand when it plays. Atlantic. Good night. Also, you want China. Terrorist. Gone. Gone. China. Tang. Curved. Acting. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Conception. Conception. And 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 going. Changed. Accomplishment. God. God. Chechens. Treasures. Gruesome. Gruesome. Together. Games. Tired. Ash. Ash. Today. Cookie. Cookie. Protest. Archives. 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 Generation captures captures graves 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 acceleration two Chechens both apocalyptic conflict conflict genetic so um 
Uh, so the time period begins, 1990 is th around about the time Nelson Mandela was released from prison. 2003 was Operation Desert Storm, so a second Iraq war. And in that period we have like the beginning of Apple computers, or not just the beginning, it's like Photoshop, it's like really having a computer at home uh, about broadband. Like it, it, we just go through this kind of um, like incredible part of our history. Um, if it was to run from beginning to end consecutively, it would take about 87 years, I think. And we, the rules we have for this work are that it, um, it, when you stop the work, it picks up exactly where it's uh, stopped on the human genome. So we wanted to very much to give it a lifespan. So once you get to the end of the human genome, it will take roughly 80 years to go all the way through. If it was playing 24 hours a day, then the, the, the work stops and is completed. Um, and I guess with triggering all of these little clips of document, mostly documentary footage, we kind of wanted to create this poetic but kind of documentary snapshot of what humans were doing during that time when we were first sequencing our, our genome. And I guess the focus on language in the way that we do is perhaps to suggest that, that language itself is perhaps one of the distinguishing features we have as animals that, that allows us to apprehend our genetic code in the first place. Um, but it was so amazing to work with these guys in Dundee because they were so open and generous. And actually, they told us so much about the genome which is not so well known. Um, uh, one really key thing is I think that the, the collaborative process, it was all supposed to be anonymous, but they were pretty sure that most of the reference genome, which it now is, so further genetic research is done against this genome as a reference, uh, was a, a white man in his 50s from North America. Yeah. So, so I mean, to begin with, I was like, oh, well, that's not great, but yeah, what, what, yeah, it's just one, isn't it? But then you realise that this is the reference genome, which means that if you are not a white man in your fifties, which uh, yeah, most of us aren't, um, it means that drug <laughs> John is doing good, but um, but it means that the drugs that are being tested are optimized for that person. So you know. a, a really fascinating example yeah. of structural bias just built straight into our research. But anyway, the other piece of work we want to talk about is a perfume that we made. And the perfume is called Apocalypse. So um, whenever it, one of the joys of being an artist is getting to travel around. And I guess whenever we go to a new town, a new country, we like to go to the museum. And our kind of thing is we go and like to look at depictions of the apocalypse. One of our favourites. So, so um, we suddenly we just we, we talk about you know the depictions, our favourites, and then we we started to realise that we wanted to do our own depiction of the apocalypse, but we wanted to do it um, chemically. So we took the King James Bible uh, and we made a list in the Book of Revelation um, uh, of everything that we kind of thought that has an olfactory property. So not, not like sort of angels or trumpets or that you might imaginatively make some, some connection with. Just stuff that you can see here, our list of terms. We had a big argument about trumpets because I believe there is a distinct smell from trumpets. But anyway, um, that's when it was brilliant to be working with a perfumier. And so we worked um, uh, um, with, with a perfumier in, in Edinburgh. Yeah, so Ewan McCall, who is a fantastic, uh, quite young perfumer that we got introduced to, and it, it has to be one of the most exciting uh, collaborations we've ever done, because for us, not only was it working with a new person, with a new set of references and a new approach to making, but actually it was somebody who could open up um, working with smell and thinking about smell, thinking about time. And we learned so much through this process, and he was so fantastically generous. He, he basically made the perfume. So to talk about collaboration in that sense, um, he, he, he sort of is the, the fragrance and developed it. We did it through a lot of discussion, a lot of versions. I think there were maybe 17, 18 different iterations mm -hmm. that we bounced backwards and forwards. But he went off and did a massive amount of research. He even went to morgues and sort of got the smells of corpses and you know all sorts of things and produced this perfume that has over 100 materials in it. So it's very unusual compared with a commercial, typical commercial product because it's made almost entirely of low-end notes and middle tones. 
rather than high end, which is what most commercial perfumes are. You sort of get a hit of smell at a high end, which decays more quickly than the lower ones. Uh, and then you sort of you get used to it, and then you buy more of it, you wear more of it, and you buy more of it. Whereas this one actually has a timeline. It takes about two days uh, to really re resolve itself in its sort of final smell. And it's very sweet to begin with. Uh, it has a kind of um, incense quality, and then sort of leathery, ozone-y, and, and the, the, the sweetness is often associated with putridity as well. So, uh, so I guess you mentioned that um, he, he was there, the, the perfume was immediately saying to us, it should be sweet, because if you're talking about rotting and putrefaction, and, you know, like proving to us that actually when bodies decay or when plants decay, actually it is a sweet odour that is coming off them. Mm. Yeah. And, and for us, it, yeah, I mean, for us, I think with our practice, we've been practicing a long time, and I think we become more and more um, committed to collaborating, but committed to collaborating in it, as, a, as a way of understanding the world through different people, uh, understanding different experiences, and being able to kind of um, get access to the incredible knowledge bases. Mm. And this one's a really nice, straightforward one because it's a limited edition that is selling as a luxury product, effectively, in, a, in a, an art context, which itself, I think, is sort of interesting that we can co-opt that context to then make a representation of, of the end uh, as a luxury good. Um, uh, but then it means that out of the, the 50 bottles there are, we can just split it three ways as proceeds. It's all very, very straightforward. And... Um, uh, and, 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 and it was, it was a, a pleasure to be able to do that, wasn't it? Yeah, a complete pleasure, complete pleasure. So um, I think we should stop here, and that gives you a little bit of an idea about maybe how we approach and think about collaboration. I actually just wanted to start by going back to something that you said, John, in the first presentation about community as an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to get all of you talking about the potential politics attached around collaboration and its use as a strategy of forming communities and working, working with others, if that's OK. Yeah, well, I can start a little bit. Um, about resistance and communities. I mean, I guess I, I, more and more um, it feels that it's very important to nurture your community and to create good people and have good people around you. And I think there is something about working on a project or collaborating uh, enables a trust but also enables a, a vision of being able to create something better together, which, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that, that's a kind of nice starting point. I mean, I mean, I guess we can only give practical examples from our point of view, which are, which are, are, are pragmatic in the sense that we, you know, the two things we spoke about had a sort of specific collaborative aspect to it. Um, we work together as collaborative artists, but also we, we have a kind of people around us that work for us and work with us that forms a kind of community ongoing. Uh, but, and that gets delivered in a, a more traditional way where there might be a commission and we are able to split up kind of monies and things like that. Uh, but then also we both teach at art school as well, which is a, a very um, significant part of the way we live our life. I wouldn't necessarily call it part of our practice, but, um, but it's where you can share your experience because um, essentially at art school, we're just people that have done it for longer than they have for the most part, um, the students coming, and you can just share experiences across a different, a kind of particular kind of time frame. And that's, that's a kind of privilege, really. I suppose, in a way, the elephant in the room with this notion is that the, the art industry, the commercial art world, is, is selling a message that art is made by an individual who's a genius and it's therefore very expensive. Um, and what, you know, a lot of the things we're all playing with uh, undermine that central message that, that the industry's been built on. So there are issues around that that are quite interesting and community. You know, the idea that art has been made by community, which it has, you know, I think of, I think of art as being a long-term and ongoing social socially driven experiment um, it, it is made by society effectively 
um, it is kind of at odds in a way with how it's been been sold and not just sold commercially but sold as a, a, an idea so there's an issue there with collaboration and I don't know what that means but it's just the same thing um, yeah, um, we were talking in the last panel, um, somebody mentioned cave paintings, and um, I think that's a, a, a really um, interesting and beautiful example of, um, of an artwork that really isn't about an individual production. That is, it not only is it made by many hands, but the time span of those paintings is huge. And this idea that, that, that you were, that the cave itself, that what it's doing is the thing. I and mean, we were trying to sort of open that up a bit with our presentation, that the work itself collaborates as a life mm -hmm. that you kind of put out there. And, um, and people can interact with it and, and, and collaborate in a sense. It can collaborate with other artworks. And the cave paintings were made over tens of thousands of years. People would come and just add to it, and and also the use of what's existing. So just bringing out something that existed already, um, this idea of material collaboration um, is really interesting. And um, coming right round the other side is the the opening up of the studio with this shop idea that. Um, allows us to have conversations across um, from you know either they can be about art they can be about something completely different people come in for all sorts of different reasons and you get an idea of a community and, um, and an area and uh, conversations that um, it's very alive and changes the studio space and what that um, space is for so I think it's interesting, you know, that there's a, a, a sort of distinction being drawn about where artists might work collaboratively together to, to create work, but then when that process is opened up as well to involve other participants in the generation, you know, the generation of it, you know, thinking, Alan, of the, the project where you're working with the, the group of young people to kind of create the, the, the gravestones. Yes, I mean, I suppose there's a straightforward idea, isn't there, that, um, if they, you know, it's a straightforward idea that all artworks kind of knock on and, and affect the artwork in front of them or behind them or after them or whatever. Um, so that's a straightforward idea. And then you can, you know, even within that, you can then open, the, uh, as we've all done uh, to some extent, uh, the conversation in producing the artwork to direct influence by other people in the room. So, yeah, it's all connected, it's messy, it's so messy, it's all connected up. It's just yeah. bizarre to think of it as anything but collaboration, really, in a way. I mean, I, I think the canon itself is is a discussion in lots of ways. It's, it's collaborative in the sense that it yeah. is emergent, I think. Yeah. So there you go, what's the point of this talk? <laughs> <laughs> And I think, you know, one of the things we touched on earlier, and, you know, Alan, you, you talked about this, you mentioned this, is, is, the, is the market, you know, the kind of the market driver. That's slightly more problematic, just yeah. from our, you know, day-to-day yeah. -day yeah. point of view. Yeah. I mean, I don't think art history is going to worry about that particularly. Mm -hmm. Maybe it does a bit. Yeah, it does a bit. So but just in terms of, you know, that idea of, you know, how you operate in a context where there is such a, you know, the market holds such a prevalent position now, do you, I mean, I don't know if you all want to sort of talk, I mean, Alan, you touched upon that in your talk, but, you know, those difficulties in sort of interfacing with with the commercial, commercial context. I mean, I think there's um, a huge division there where, you know, if we talk about where we encounter art, or perhaps where artists prefer to encounter art, it's not necessarily in the galleries anymore at present. Um, I mean, the two sort of um, occasions that struck me in the last month that I enjoyed the most um, was the Theaster Gates last Saturday with the Black Image uh, Corporation, I think they're called. And I was on the protest march and we went to the Theaster Gates 
exhibition and mm -hmm. the encounter, he presented uh, the, the Black um, Image Corporation were doing a um, performance and you got a glass of tea and it, it was one of the best performances I think I've ever seen. And it was a kind of, you know, you felt like you should be there, you felt really sort of belonging. And then the other occasion was Rashid Arim's opening of his his restaurant uh, in Stoke Newington, which was probably about a month ago. Um, and the sort of satisfaction of, of um, uh, encountering art in that way uh, is something probably a little bit beyond the, although it's very connected to the commercial aspects of, you know, say the 180, the Strand is very expensive. <laughs> Place to be, uh, you know, putting on, on an art um, project like that. Um, but back to the cave painting thing, you know, where does art belong? Um, and I think that's very much um, in the air and you know, the discussion of, 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 of all of the panel. I, I, my feeling is that things are changing, though. I mean, I really feel that. Um, I didn't know of many people collaborating when we started. Um, and now, if I look around, I see a lot more um, groups collaborating. And actually, the idea of just two people collaborating seems quite kind of like small and kind of, you know, like. Old fashioned. Yeah, yeah, old fashioned. And yeah, so, so actually, I think that younger artists now are making work and collaborating in, in quite sophisticated and interesting ways. And I think, um, you know, when the work is good and exciting, then people follow. And, and, you know, the galleries follow. It just, it happens. It might happen maybe too slowly, but it does happen. And I think it is changing. I mean, I feel quite optimistic. Yeah. I think, well, I think at, at the level of practice, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but. But it's very complicated when you get start to bring the institutions in because you have the commercial galleries, private collectors, and, the, um, and then public collections, and and the relationship that artists might or might not have with that is just it's such a big topic. I don't know. And why do you think that sort of process of collaboration is emerging now? Do you think it's about how people? Form that sense of community, and it's about support structures and about about networks. I think it's partly economics. I think it's very hard economically uh, now to be a sole practitioner. If you think about how much a studio space costs, and you think about living in London, I, I think there's economics. But I also think there is a kind of there's a flexibility in working that uh, that we didn't have, and there's a flexibility in materials as well. And and ideas, so I think, yeah, I think I think there's econ I think there's lots of things at play. I think there's been a lot of social change. I think also the ability to stay in contact. Mm -hmm. If you think about friendship groups, um, could dissolve if you moved out of a street, like maybe 20, 30 years ago. Now with like lots of things, WhatsApp, you know, like contact is different. So how we collaborate can be different. We don't always have to be in the physical same space. Do you think, um, say, dare I say, young generations? Do you think they're less they're less likely to kind of label label themselves in terms of this sort of collaboration label, or are they just organically more or less work? Well, if, even when they just are, mm -hmm. even when they just are collaborating, they wouldn't label yes, themselves. Yes. Yeah. I guess maybe that's true, but I think there's two things at play. There's change that's happening, so it's sort of it's a slower cycle, but then there's also the change one goes through as one gets older individually as well, and you might have different priorities at different times, you know, in terms of how you feel a responsibility to uh, collaborative context, but also to your work if you, if you do or you don't have, you know, feel like you should be doing things for the work as well. I just wanted to come back to this idea, Alan, you talked about producers and consumers kind of in your talk. I just wanted to ask you all about that, about the relationship between those two processes in in your in your practices. Excuse me, could you all speak more in the mic? Sorry. Oh sure, sorry. 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 Anyway. sorry. We're just the question was about 
the relationship between producers and consumers in the, pra in the practice? Well, my favourite relationship is I fantasised about them being exactly the same person at exactly the same mm. time. That would be my favourite, um, that would be my ultimate goal. And I and actually, you know, when, I, when I'm happiest with what I'm doing, I really don't know what's about to happen and I almost don't know how I got there, you know. So that, that would be the same conditions I'd be in coming across my own work mm. um, for the first time if I wasn't me. So that's the fantasy. So mm. I don't know if that helps at all with your question, but that would be my fantasy anyway. Does anyone else understand that? <laughs> I suppose I just want to say that I want to be surprised by anything that I've made um, or seen. So it's exactly the same. Uh, an art experience is an art experience. Whoever made it, even if I made it myself, I want to be just as surprised and, and uh, uh, enlivened by it. It doesn't always happen, I've got to say that, but you know, that's the fantasy. Good. Um, quite, quite, quite a lot of the work that we make kind of tries to take a sort of anthropological position where we're all participants and okay we might make something but then we participate in its kind of completion but when it's shown or experienced at some level and when, when you use generative processes or things that are unpredictable inside the work that kind of levels it even more because things can surprise us if we just set a set of rules going as well as other people if they're witnessing it as well but then I think beyond that if other people are making things or other people are going to other things, then there is an anthropological space where we're all participating in it. Um, yeah, I mean, we often um, build systems that uh, hold Some other artworks. Mm -hmm. So um, that, but the, the, the idea of um, the plan, no plan, mm -hmm. and how you can, you have to know to some extent what you're, what you're going to be doing and in order to have get people to help you or to communicate with other people who are going to be doing things that there has to be a plan of some sort but if it gets too planned it becomes it, it it's you're not able the work isn't able to collaborate then so it has to sort of live as well so um, there, there are different material ways, I think, that everybody allows that sort of unpredictability to happen within a sort of plan. I think it's in all of the work. Isn't yeah, it? a kind of plan, you know, so you want to keep it wide enough, but within certain boundaries. Um, and uh, it, that's, re that's just really important. So, the, yeah, the, 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 that, that sort of, it's not so much producer consumer, but it's that kind of control, not con the openness and, and, and the controls that's where the sort of um, activity is, is happening, I think, for us and for all of us, actually. Good. I mean, we've taken a sort of fairly rosy and positive view of collaboration. I just wondered whether we were, before we open it up to the floor, just to talk about those friction points and those kind of creative tensions that happen within a sort of process of process of collaboration. And if anyone wanted to to say something about that, you want some dirt on Jeremy Dalla? No. <laughs> Is that what you're after? No. I won't give you any. <laughs> I love him. He's my pal. We, we were once told by a gallerist that, that they would like to do a show with us, and um, but actually weren't going to because we're, we're collaborating artists, uh, which is presents a problem when we stop working together. <laughs> On a commercial legally, basis. Legally. I think just yeah. in terms of who owns what, you know. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I mean, there's been lots of lovely lines like that. Yeah, and I think there was always downsides, yeah. So I, I remember people going, but you want to do something by yourself? Because we've got this agenda for women working with technology. <laughs> just, just the one outing? Like, you know, like, so, 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 yeah, there always are downsides at different points. But there's, yeah, I think in the end, it's actually, it's quite good yeah, in the end, you have to ride the whole big picture out, don't you? 
but the waiting, we were not going to uh, give you a show because we're waiting for you to split up is also an <laughs> <laughs> it's also another kind one, isn't it? Good. I've never suffered that one because I Have split up with all my collaborators when I see <laughs> so that's all that's right for me. Yeah, <laughs> so. a lot of tension there. Yeah. Yeah. Clean break. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the contract when we start. I'll work with you, but only for three weeks, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think complexity of any kind is something that the market doesn't really appreciate, mm. and so you know, the simpler the better, really, and. Um, you know, the, the, even though you say, well, that the, the work is commercially very straightforward, mm -hmm. um, just the fact that there are. But who made it? Yeah. <laughs> Which one are you Yeah, we want to know who made the painting. Yeah. So, yeah, and great. did you get that question? But who actually does yeah, the work? Yeah, who actually made it? Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but especially yeah. because we're so sort of concerned with painting, we, we make a lot of paintings. But, no, but which one actually did make yeah, it? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. But then uh, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, we were at the Bridget Riley, and she makes those um, beautiful watercolour plans of the work, and then her assistants yeah. make the paintings. But it's not a problem there, because it's just a thing. Yeah. So it's, it's not really it who made yeah. it. It's which one of your assistants really made this one, Damien? I really want to know. And that's what we were saying in the in the talk is that actually it's because we are putting that onto the work by saying there's two people who are making it. It's our decision to do that. Um, so do you think the visibility you're unable to ignore? Uh, you know that the, uh, with a Bridget Riley painting, I am sure if I owned a Bridget Riley painting, I'd be very happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I would go. Oh, it's a Bridget Riley. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to think about mm. the studio or the. You know, was it painted in Cornwall or was it painted in? London, you know, or which person? You know, like worked on it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that clarity. And it, yeah. So even as somebody who knows the mm. truth, I would still always like to think about Bridget with mm. a paintbrush. Mm. Yes, yeah, so well, because really, yeah. ultimately, um, painting for us is a conceptual business. So it, it's the idea of actual painting, and, and everybody knows, you know, paintings are sort of need to keep on giving, don't they? Because they just you can always paint on top of a, an existing painting, or you've got so many layers that you know it, it's it's impossible to kind of really work out, you know, anything about a painting. So it has that object value to it, um, which is so um, historic anyway, and, and really usually for the male genius. Um, but then if you say that painting has been conceptualized or painted by two people, then it, 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 break, it it's a, it's a, breaks everything down. I'm really interested that even you, who works in a collaborative mm. partnership, wants to have a Bridget Wright that is only Bridget Wright. Yeah, you? I would really like it's that. It's amazing, isn't it? I know. So I know. We're, I know. Our own, we're our own. That's you know. my um, patriarchy in here, isn't yeah. it? Just yeah. going, oh. Mm. Like, yeah, but, but I mean, t to be honest, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I get it. I, I get, get it. it. it is, you know, when your friends give you a bit of work, you want the bit that looks the most like their work. Yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible it's the same old thing. It is a prejudice, isn't yeah. it, in terms of. but. To be 100% honest, I don't have any paintings. No, at home. so no it's, it's not Riley's actually. Own, no. Well, no, it, it's not actually that kind of urge of the solo ownership. It's a monetized thing. Really. It's all about the money, Sharon. <laughs> That's why I started collaborating. <laughs> It was about the cash. That's another thing about collaborating. They never give you twice the fee, or very rarely give you twice the fee. Have you had twice yes, the fee? Yes, because occasionally it's twice yeah. the fees. <laughs> so, that's another down, downside well, if you're thinking you about collaborating. Well, people will say we can afford one of you, but to travel yeah. up, but not two. Yeah. And you're like, oh. We're, we're, we're often not two, we're one and a half. Like, is that how you, yeah, well, how I mean, that's, that's how sometimes how it works out. We don't, we don't yeah. usually have a choice. Really. We don't want to ask who the half is. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to make? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're going to open it up to the floor if there's any uh, questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, 
we'll go to go to Mary Alice first, and then go go to go to Kevin. Do you want the Do you want the mic? Uh, I'll, I'll just speak loudly. Speak loudly. Um, given the complexities that you've described around authorship, ownership, and lack of commercial um, uh, um, opportunity for collaboration, could you say something briefly about your measures of success? What makes a successful collaboration? To what extent is surprise and the element of the unpredictable part of that? If you get out without being shot, that's quite good. <laughs> um, but surprise, I think, you know, for me, it's, I suppose it's that thing where I want to come across a work, I don't want to make a work ever, actually, um, in reality, because it's too painful and dull to make it. But, I mean, it's definitely the point about planning. There's a big aspect of this that I know exactly what size the space it's got to fit in and how many bits are going to get in it. You know, like 27 plinths wasn't an accident. So, you know, there's a lot of control up to a certain level. But, and, and it's always this thing about the reveal, you know, as tight to the deadline as possible is when the thing comes together. So it's successful if I'm finished before the opening no one hates me. It doesn't cost me actual money out of my own pocket, and uh, and I'm surprised by what's happened. So that's for me. That would make a good thing. Well, we we started speaking to the thingy quite a while back. Um, I'm invited to, to be an uh, artist in residence in the Lane Gallery in, in Newcastle. And the first thing we said to the curator is, OK, what's the budget? Where's the money? Uh, is there a budget for production? Is there a budget for hospitality? Is there a budget who pays for the in invite cards? Who pays? Where's, where's all the money? Literally, tell us where all the money is. So then we started to make artworks out of the hospitality budget. We managed to get the money out, pull it out of the museum for um, the, the advertising, the, the printing, the private view costs, and we actually made that the, the work itself. Um, and that that is how we like to, to, to operate. So if, if on the invite evening, you know, the glass um, uh, cake stands have been made by us, the actual food has been uh, you know, found by us. Um, the drinks, it's all part of the actual artwork. So when you're talking to a visitor and they're going, where's the artwork? You're like, we're drinking it kind of thing. So I think we get enormous joy out of uh, dealing with budgets in that way. One, one of the great things about working together, um, it, from, from my point of view, is when you first start talking about something and you're trying to begin a work, um, the discussion takes it out of your head, or either of our heads, and it's on the table in front of us, and we can have, a, it sort of externalises the work in a way that, that just feels like you can be really productive about the way you look at it, and you don't get caught inside a kind of echo chamber. Um, I think for me, the measure of success is probably just being able to be in a position where money isn't such a worry that you can care about the work and develop the work. And in the end, for artists, I think it can only really be about the work and all the institutional stuff beyond that. You know, you might feel responsible, like it would be nice to get work in collections, where ultimately, which might have to go by way of a commercial route, um, because then the collections might have a preservation strategy which might allow the work to persist. But, and that's perhaps a responsibility that we can or we can take on if we want to as artists. But in the end, it's just about the work you make and, and, and the point of sharing it with people, because that's all, all, all you have in the end. Kevin, you had a question. Thank you. I mean, I, I think what you're talking about, artists collaborating with other artists, should be kind of working out. But when I'm, I think is a much more pressing, pressing issue and one that nobody seems to mention about when uh, about collaboration with non-artists. Mm. How do you navigate the massive ethical issues that go with that? That you're coming from a privileged space and collaborating people from outside of that space. That seems to me to be a minefield for uh, people to be abused, the things that go wrong, mm. yeah. the passage of people mm. from. I was always stung by the work 
that Steve Willits did with people, poor people by and large living at the top floors of uh, council flats in West London, that was all within a photographic panel. That would end up in a private gallery in Zurich and bought by somebody who was a part of the system who kept the bench there in the top floor flat for them with the invoice lip or whatever it was. How the hell do you reconcile all of those contradictions? Um, so I'll do that, take that. <laughs> Thank you. No, I totally agree. And I think the that there are lots of problems and I think you can when we started off it we were just working together and I think we've um, learned a lot from lots of other organizations so somewhere that really impressed me about collaborations uh, is Arts Catalyst so Arts Catalyst um, is based near King's Cross and um, we can I can say lots about them but but Basically, they're there to get collaborations going between artists and scientists very, very broadly. And what I love about them, and something that I learned really quickly from them, is everyone has to be paid the same. Everyone has to be valued the same. Because otherwise, there is no point. You know, there's no point in... There has to be that kind of... That has to be the benchmark of a, a collaboration. And I think experience has taught us um, that actually... You know, contracts are really good thing to sit, even if it's not a written contract. Because, because for me, a contract is a letter that I can write and understand, and the person who I want to work with or who wants to work with me can understand. And it's a really nice way to actually just sit down and write each other letters till you're completely comfortable about um, the outcome before you start taking time, money, you know, all, all those kind of things. But that has taken quite a long time to clock. And, I th you know, for me, it's very important to be as ethical as you can in your practice. Because, yeah, because you have to, yeah, you have to, yeah. you want, yeah, you want to extend. Mm. You're all saying there's not much money in it anyway. It's, it, okay. You're talking about the money as, and you've been equitable as being symbolic of something that's much more important, which mm -hmm. is about being credited mm -hmm. as a part of the work. It's, it's, it's not for sure mm -hmm. you should be getting the same money. But mm -hmm. It's like, ultimately, how do you share that? Uh, the, the, the feedback, the magic that you're yeah. about. We do it in a variety of ways. That, so you have to take it case by case, basically. We do it each artwork by each work, artwork. And we tend to work quite slowly. So, so with, for example, um, a short film about war, we credit everybody with it, who took a photograph in there. We're in communication with them. You know, like... It, but, but you, I don't the, mean literally yeah. credit, literally pay. Yeah. In, in a bigger sense. In a bigger sense. It's, it's a joint work. Mm -hmm. Yes. But is there, what more should we do? I don't know. I'm oh. Just, I'm just <laughs> um, it, I mean, I think, it's a mind thing. I think one of the most complicated things you raise is the, the kind of um, privilege that certain aspects of the art world represents and the, the silo that it maintains. I mean, it's a difficult thing. I'm afraid I don't have an answer, really. But you can take your experiences into that situation and try and do your best. But, I, but, it's, a, but it's very difficult. I don't really know. I think that um, maybe we try to have tried to open up the studio a bit more in 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 the way that you're describing, so that you know we we use the shop as a vehicle in a certain way, but it's also open for other people to use it, um, and uh, and they do, and it's um, you know it it operates as an artwork, but it also operates as something else, as um, a meeting place or uh, it, pe people. Um, uh, leave information out for other people to access there. It's, um, it, you know, they can uh, they uh, meet their friends and want to do um, meet for lunch. They can do something like that. It's it's a it, it's actually um, a usable space in different ways because I think it's very difficult if um, you're collaborating with people who aren't artists to then say that, for example, in the Stephen Willits example that you gave, you know, 
uh, yes, he 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 sh he should have paid his models, but but they're also not artists. So how do you you know what's the gain for them? As you're asking, um, it, it, and and perhaps there there was none, uh, and that's a problem. But the the what we're trying to suggest the shop is that it's a mutual thing. It can't operate as an artwork for somebody who isn't an artist, but it can operate as a valuable opportunity in another way, potentially. So that um, is... It's how you do what you do. Yeah, and, and, and so, yeah, opening up those opportunities, um, I think is a very important aspect of collaboration, and it, but it's not necessarily um, that you, you can't bring everybody. The, you know, if somebody isn't an artist, they're not an art. They're not. They're not um, engaged in that in that conversation. But it has to be of value in their own in the way that they want it to be of value. Uh, which isn't about being, because being paid is a given. If everybody's being paid, they need to be paid the same. But it's how they can utilise the opportunities. But, but if the whole day is on debt of the work is that one person isn't an artist, he's a train driver, or guess what, she's a cleaner, then what you're doing in that process of ordering is bringing another kind of value to the work which, ironically, you know, their non-art status makes it more valuable. Well, there's not a there's not a mutuality in that in that um, situation that you're describing. That's not how we work. No, 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 I'm so, not, yeah. I'm, I'm not accusing anybody. No, I know you're not accusing. I'm just saying it's a model that I don't think that that any of us actually. Oh, I have. Yeah, we have. Who's yeah, the cleaner? Yeah, we're train drivers, train everyone. Driver. But the, I think the, the thing... <laughs> all of them. We, so I've made works explicitly with work made by people that don't call themselves artists. Um, and I suppose all I'm marketing is my interest. That's all that I've got to offer. And all that I'm doing, really, is... Is, I mean, so we were very clear, I was very clear especially, uh, to only include stuff in the exhibition that was already on public display in some form. So all we're doing is shifting the location. I understand what you're saying, and it is problematic, I don't know how you go around it, but at the end of the day, I, I kind of like it, and I kind of want it. I want this stuff to be on show where it's more visible and to be valued a bit more. So, and the only tool I have for increasing access or interest in material is to is perhaps shift its location where it's where it's displayed or or who, what the audience is for it um, and 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 you know and I think I was reasonably upfront with what we were doing if people weren't interested in being in the show we tried to talk to as many people as we could if people weren't interested in being in these shows then obviously they were, wouldn't be in them so okay I think I think we've maybe this is a conversation that can keep going over lunchtime.